Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of AI in the Enterprise. We're going to take on a topic that I know many of you have asked for us to discuss, which is the topic of intelligent automation. And of course, before we jump in, it takes it's worthwhile to take a second and actually just quickly define that. Definitions are important. Intelligent automation, many of us discuss, is the intersection of automation and artificial intelligence. As AI has come in to be much more of a pervasive capability in large enterprises, we're finding automation is now able to take advantage of it and move up the value stack to the next step. And we call that intelligent automation. And that combined capability, which is all of the robotic process automation and other automation techniques, it includes all of the orchestration, the workflow, um, and, and business rules management. It includes all of the AI accelerators that we've talked about previously on this show and elsewhere. And then of course, all of the visualization that drives the experience to be able to get adoption and business results. And that combined portfolio, if you will, is intelligent automation. So now that we've defined intelligent automation, let's take a step back. We know we're deploying it at scale in large companies uh, and small companies over the world. And what we're finding out is some of those intelligent automation deployments are very successful and yet others aren't. I wanna actually double click on that gap and try and get to the bottom of that. And to do that, I've invited on our show today, a good friend, uh, a, a colleague I've worked with for a long time. He's been an advisor to companies. He's been, uh, he is an analyst right now in the intelligent automation space. He's been a provider of AI technologies and he's obviously been an operator as well. And that multidimensional perspective, as you know, from my other shows, I value a lot. And so with that, over to Tom Reuner. Tom, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, Sanjay. It's a great pleasure. Awesome. I know, Tom, you're based in London. And I've always wanted to ask you this on public television or public uh, 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 shows like this. Tell me, what's up with your accent? Where's that from? Gosh, people will sing and sit somewhere else, but as people will easily pick up, I'm from Germany. But unfortunately, I learned English far too late in life, so the accent is sticking with me. So a lot of confusion on many calls. But thanks for reminding me of it. I always enjoy speaking with you, Tom. You know, beyond the accent, I want to get into the meat of the topic. And listen, intelligent automation has at once amazing possibilities, but equally very difficult to pull off. Can you just really start at the 50,000 foot level for us and tell us why are, what are the reasons, you know, I, intelligent automation is not then, if not done well, can become a failure? I think it's probably not just a question of intelligent automation, actually. I think we can apply it with the same thought process for the broad context of digital transformation. And we just cast our memory back, literally, what we're all going through at the moment, COVID. It's a question of, are processes working? Can we deliver service and products? We have to move beyond incrementalism, not just a little bit here. So it's literally a question of, are organization moving? These are the key questions we have to answer. So I, I, you know, this incremental, incrementalization, sorry, um, that point's a really important point because too often I go into discussions and the discussion is, you know, we've got this whole footprint, but can we take this one little bit over here and automate that? Why is that wrong? I mean, on one hand, you'd say, hey, we can move the puck forward on this bit and then the collective result of that will show up on the system, but it doesn't really quite come out that way. Why is that? Very good question. And for me, almost three points are important in that context. And first and foremost, we have to be very clear what the outcome you're trying to achieve, what the goal, you know, your customer asking, what are we working toward? It's not about technology, it's literally about what's the outcome for him. The second one, we have to move, and again, just building on the thought of we have to move beyond incrementalism. We have to take the perspective of end-to-end -end delivery, end-to-end -end automation, because only then, and again, COVID is a painful reminder, we get to the outcomes we want. And the last point, we have this tendency as an industry, it's a noisy industry, it's a lot of hype, it's about the next shiny tools, but actually what it is all about, we have to think about integrating into existing environments. How do we help customers sitting on all the technology debt as well as process debt? These are the three points jumping to mind for me. Wow, there's a lot in there. I wanna actually take each of those three and kind of go a little deeper. So a clarity on business outcome, this notion of understanding the full and complete picture before you jump in and start fixing the bits and bytes. Tell us a little bit more about that. And I'll tell you, look, in my mind, when you said that, the analogy that came to mind is we're moving from lo lo the, the locomotive industry to the airline industry. And just because you find a new uh, uh, a wing, you can't just add it to a train and say, well, we're going to move there. And I, it's a crude analogy, but isn't some of that what's at play here that without thinking about the big picture, if we start doing you know, these micro surgeries in automation, it doesn't really give results. 
no, I couldn't agree more with you. And I think when I started to look at the space, literally, I think seven years back, and I was saw the common denominator for all those discussions, for all those approaches was literally decoupling routine service delivery from labor arbitrage, meaning we don't have any media breaks anymore, any process breaks. We don't need people helping us solving problems. All those technologies which get subsumed under the moniker and talent automation should fulfill that. But if I'm honest, as an industry, we have to be moved beyond that. In the last couple of years, we were quite happy to not even talking about, but we're happy with task automation. We're happy with employee productivity. But again, coming back to my initial statement, what COVID is forcing us to, to, to put up from our forefront of all our thinking, it's end to end. We lost that. And until we have that in our mindset, we are clear on that goal. We won't succeed. That's on the sound as tried, but I think again, COVID is a painful reminder for that. And so for, you know, just as a practical piece of advice for folks out there that are looking to get into intelligent automation, deploy that in their enterprises, get success out of it. What's a good way to start thinking about end to end? What, 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 are, what are one or two things you would not do? What are one or two things you would do? First and foremost, it's a long journey. Anybody telling you, unfortunately, the hype in the market is often gonna suggesting or appears to be, it's an easy fit, just putting yet another tool, another point solution into your environment. I think clients should be very careful about it. And I'm quite reminded, I had a great discussion with Ben Rayner from, from, from City, some of on their journey. And it's literally, it's hard work because the reality is many organizations are deeply siloed different business units, organization, different geography. So it's a long journey trying to literally impose or overlay all these, these complexity, this heterogeneity with a common uh, standard for processes, but equally for innovation. And again, that's hard work. Uh, but also what we learned from that discussion with City is not only that, but then you have to say, you have to layer all the innovation, but literally some of the, the, the thought process of, of layering innovation on these standardized processes is probably a good one because again, it's not one tool which gets you to the process nirvana or to the outcome. It's a long journey. It's all about orchestration. That's what people have to keep in mind. So that makes a lot of sense. This, this bit about end-to-end -end is such an important idea. Uh, thinking through ahead of time the business outcome that you're driving and then backing up from there is obviously key and integral. You said two other things that kind of caught my attention. You talked about the necessity of integrating with the existing environments. Don't leave behind what you already have in a rush to design the new. I think it's a really important point. I want to come back to that. And then, of course, I want to come back to this noisy industry and all of these shiny tools. Let's wait on that. Talk to us about integration with existing environments. Any tips, any advice, any, any learnings you can share with us there? Thing. It's literally, again, being mindful of what I said earlier, uh, be mindful on the disconnected system, and the disconnected business units we are having. But the goal should be really some of thinking about, have we a common data model that can drive all those information? Can we literally trigger process flow, which can cut across all these organizational boundaries? That's not, for me, that's not the nirvana that we should or could arrange at some point, but we see already good examples among our clients doing exactly that. Yeah. One example that will come up at the back of my head and just a recent discussion with a global CP, uh, CPG client. So they started thinking around automating workflows, very traditional in IT, ITSM, so help desk scenarios. So they started something in the big platform service now. But now they're taking us, taking us to procurement, completely different mindset, different environment, even corporate legal. So completely different setting. So they're starting their journey. But the starting point is the understanding we need one data model, which of course something like service now brings you, and have common workflows. And that's, I think for me, this kind of mindset, and it's more the mindset to start out, that's more important than, than following any hype on the technologies without those mindsets invariably it's likely you end up with the wrong goals, the wrong, uh, the wrong results. One of the, best, one of the best pieces of advice I got when I was speaking with uh, someone else in the space was this notion of whenever you build something new, build it as an application, as a service. So anything you do, put an as a service layer around it so that it can easily integrate into your existing environment. And that gives you an ability to bring your existing footprint into the future as opposed to just sort of do these spot modifications and then create these new islands of innovation that in the end don't connect. And that's a big issue. 
Okay, you've been on the provider side of the house. Um, you were in an AI company that's on the forefront of delivering uh, new techniques and technology to solve for age-old issues. I don't want to say this, but I'll say this. You are also contributing to the noise. And so now that you're on the other side, right, how do people like us deal with all of these shiny toys, tools, new things that are coming out, and sift through that? What words of advice do you have? Well, first, of course, guilty as charged as analysts, you're part of the noise, of course. I think you have a point, I give you that. But the advice is really, again, I think it's literally coming back, looking or seek the right advice. Don't just trust your technology supplier. Look, identify who can really help you, who has the experience to do so. Because we often just fall into the trap uh, and we see that, that literally, even on the C suite, whenever they attend a conference, they're targeting their own teams. We have thought about technology X. You have to investigate or even go one step further. You have to deploy it. You need the right advice. But then again, you need also people who have the experience, have seen various phases of technology innovation can really put everything into context. Or to talk to people like yourself. Now, you are guys that jump pack. You're the masters of, of, of cutting through operational challenges. Because I think one of the example, when we talked earlier about outcomes, what it means, one example which might bring the better to life is just watching the news, COVID, horrific news all the time. Something like Rolls Royce. They're targeted literally, they're being paid for the engines for the, for the airplanes, literally only how many minutes or how much time these engines are in the air. So it's on one, and we've talked earlier about outcome. Again, I don't want to reduce it just to outcome based contracts, but it literally gives you a sense how effective an organization, how effective an operation has to be to fulfill those obligations. Again, even if you ignore COVID for a moment. And that's for me, puts up the challenge we have. Again, to get to all the stage, to have the confidence you can deliver on that. It's not about one single shiny new tool. It's much more complex. There's always an orchestration. You have to understand, if you come back to your point, uh, automation, be it one, be it AI, we have to identify the right processes, the right challenges, where we apply this innovation to progress. And that's where people often go wrong. Super powerful. Um, Tom, you talked about clarity of business outcome and not starting a project till you have that in place. You talked about thinking about end-to-end, -end, not bits and bytes, not subcomponents of the overall process. And you talked about integrating with existing environments and not getting caught up in this new shiny toy yeah. phenomena, but actually thinking about it more holistically and bringing what you have forward into the new. And I think those are very valuable pieces of advice. And I. You know, I've known you for a while, we're good friends, so I pulled your leg a little bit on, on you being on the other side of the house, but you know, I know you took that in good jest and, and I appreciate your comment back. I think what you said is very valuable and it's one that at least I have believed in and I know many in my audience do, which is to say that digital transformation is really a large opportunity. It gives us the ability to be able to drive new capability, new functionality, think about new operating models and deliver value in ways that we haven't previously done. And in that, it's amazing. But to get it right, you almost have to start with our target operating model. You have to design that end-to-end -end journey. You have to then translate it into the new business technology backplane, the architecture that's going to enable you to do that. And of course, that architecture will require new components and new tools and new technologies and new shiny toys, if you will. But it's in the context of that end-to-end. -end. It's the context of that full picture. And I think the comments you made today really bring focus and spotlight on that. And I appreciate you doing so. I want to turn to my audience for a second. You know, Tom Reiner, um, accomplished, um, first off, thinker, advisor, it's got a point of view. Uh, you're now at your new digs um, in London. Um, you're LinkedIn connected with us on the network. I call upon our audience to reach back into Tom as you come across projects and ideas, if you have questions and thoughts. I found him very valuable resource for me, and I hope you will as well. Tom, thank you for taking the time today. Lushing, it's great talking to you. Thanks so much. Great having you here. And thanks everyone for joining. Goodbye until next time.